Good morning, everyone. My name is Wes. I'm part of our leadership team here at Crossbridge, and I want to welcome you to our online worship gathering this morning, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, we're really excited to have you here today. Thanks so much for being a part of this place. Uh, whether you feel like, hey, I've been a believer in Jesus for years, or you're figuring out, or you're not sure you have any faith at all, uh, you're welcome to join us here, and we're glad to have you this morning. Uh, we're going to sing some songs together to God this morning, just to lift up our praise to him. And uh, right there from your couch or on your patio, wherever it is you're sitting as you're watching this, uh, we'd love for you to sing with us. Even in a crazy season like coronavirus, there's always a reason for us to praise. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come Embrace us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives. A joy and prize to see the captives' hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We may revive this earth.
coming. It's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will reign. His broken hearts declare his grace. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, make way before the king of kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? I want to invite you to do something with me right now uh, in this moment. Uh, we just sang those words about who can stop the Lord Almighty, and I imagine for many of us right now, there are several situations where we're kind of finding ourselves thinking, yeah, it seems like that could stop it. It seems like she could stop it. He could stop it. It seems like th this is going wrong, all these different kinds of things. And my encouragement for us right now is I want us just to take a moment here to pray together and to simply ask God, God, hey, remind me that no one can stop you. One of the things I've been doing in my personal time with Jesus is I've been just spending a lot of time uh, trying to take a break after lunch each day just to read a psalm. And one of the things I've been struck by in doing that over the past uh, three or four weeks or so is that, that I'm constantly reminded of this idea that the people who wrote in the psalms were convinced and knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that God was trustworthy and they truly believe, man, nothing can stop the Lord Almighty. And in that understanding, uh, they brought their prayers, their stuff to him, knowing that he could answer and knowing that they could trust in his power at work on their behalf. And so uh, I just want to spend the next minute, man, whatever that is, just kind of call it out. If you want to share that in the comments. Uh, let us know down there. We'd love to pray for you alongside you. But let's just take a moment here together uh, to receive from God just that reminder, man, God, you are above all things.
All right, we're going to sing that line together, Who Can Stop the Lord Almighty, a few more times, kind of with that new, renewed understanding of the answer being nothing and no one. And who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Stop the Lord, our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the Unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. my mother's womb you have chosen me God your love has called my name and I've been born again to your family now your blood flows through my veins and I'm no longer on our behalf. You set the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am I am a 
has no power over me financial hardship has no power over me there's no power in my anxieties you are perfect you will provide I'm no longer a slave I'm part of your family I'll invite you right where you are uh, for us to participate in communion together. And one of the things I think is kind of a cool little thing is that uh, I would imagine none of you at home are taking this right now with, you know, the prepackaged communion wafers or whatever. Uh, that you're probably just using whatever you have. Uh, we always forget. And so last week uh, we had yogurt and granola because the Blackburn family is very healthy like that. And uh, so I would imagine you guys probably have some nice little combinations like that as well. But it's interesting to me that these little everyday life objects that, that right now in this moment, because of what they represent, the body and blood of Jesus, uh, they take on a brand new meaning. And... Um, I just think that's a really cool picture for life, that, that as we go through the ordinary average moments of life, that the ordinary average things that we encounter, they are infused with the holiness because they are places where we can find and meet God. And uh, that happens right now. And so uh, I, I'd like to invite you during this time as you feel ready. Uh, just pray, prepare your heart, and when you're ready, uh, to go ahead and participate in communion together this morning. Uh, we'll have some instructions and scriptures on the screen for you for you to join along with us. As we wrap up our time of singing this morning, I uh, would love to invite you to sing these words we began with as a prayer to God as we wrap up this moment together this morning. In your kingdom here at the
us. You desire to be among us. You gave our life for us because you love us. We pray you would build and advance your kingdom here. And we pray this in your powerful name. Hi, I'm Liz. Thanks for joining us today at Crossbridge Online. I'm here to encourage you to take a new step or to be a connector to help somebody else take a new step today with our church or with God's kingdom. One way to do that is through our connection card, which you can access online at crossbridgechristian.com slash connect. You can share prayer requests here as well as inquire about next steps for baptism or joining one of our groups. And if you're new to Crossbridge and you fill one of those out, we're going to donate $10 as a a gift to COVID-19 relief funds just for stopping by to say hi. So you should do that. Another way you can connect is in our digital lobby, which we'll have right after service. Um, go to crossbridgechristian.com slash lobby, and the password is crossbridge, all lowercase. And you can just pop on and say hi to a few new people, and our pastor Wes will be there too. You can also have a chance to connect with some new friends tonight over dinner. At 6 p.m., bring your dinner to your computer, your tablet, your phone, whatever you use. And join us at crossbridgechristian.com slash dinner for our Sunday dinner. Um, hang out as long as you like. Just pop in to say hi and invite some friends or stay for a little while, but we'd love to see you. And lastly, I want to remind you about our time to be generous. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, there's no pressure to give. This is for those of us who call Crossbridge our church home. But you can give online, you can give via text or by mail, and all that information is provided for you here on the screen one of these sides. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6 33 that as we seek first his kingdom he will provide all that we need. So financial generosity is a practical and an important way that we can practice seeking first his kingdom and seeing him provide all that we need. So thanks for being generous. Um, that's all for me. I'm actually going to turn it over to my husband who is sharing our message today. So thanks for listening. Hey Crossbridge, my name is Kane. I'm on the leadership team here and I have the privilege of, of uh, preaching the, the message today. Um, we're going to be uh, opening up with a passage in Acts chapter 8. Um, if you want to go ahead and flip to your Bibles there, Acts chapter 8, um, verses 26 through 40 is the main text we're going to be looking at today. And this is what it says. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go to, this, go to the road. Uh, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kendake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home, he was sitting in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, uh, asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning, this time that we can gather together to worship. I pray that this passage of... Um, of your book of Acts, uh, of, that we see so many great stories of how people um, were interacting with people who are far away from Jesus and, and didn't know his truth and his testimony and the realities of that story. Um, we see so many cool stories like that, like uh, we see with the eunuch and Philip and how people just in a single moment um, can turn 
um, away from their old lives and turn towards a life that centers on Christ. Um, Father, I pray that that this message and this passage be a, a good reminder of that in our lives, in our daily lives, of our need to engage with people who are disconnected from you, um, our necessity to connect them to the gospel, to the scriptures at point and tell them um, about a, a savior, about Jesus who loves them so much and so dearly. We praise you for who you are, everything that you are. We thank you again for this morning that we can gather together around um, this word and, and with each other and our families. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, right now we're in a series we're calling Crunch Time. Uh, and Crunch Time is easily understood as kind of this idea of what we do when it really matters. Uh, for us in our context at Crossbridge, it all centers around our mission of connecting disconnected people to God. And when it comes to relationships with people who are disconnected from God because they don't have a relationship with Jesus, for us, in, in our view, we, we kind of always see it as crunch time. Um, because every moment, every time that we're around somebody who doesn't know Jesus, um, that's a time where it truly matters a lot to both uh, uh, to us as a church community, but also to God. Um, today, we're going to be talking about our next element of crunch time, which is provoke. Um, once we perceive that somebody is open to the message of the kingdom of God, once we kind of perceive that God is opening that door, what do we actually talk about? How do we as Christians provoke the heart, the mind, the body of non-Christians into pursuing a relationship with Jesus? Well, exactly like we see in that story of Philip with the Ethiopian man, I think the way that we primarily do that is is through evangelism. Uh, that word evangelism is just basically like a super Christian word that simply means just telling someone about Jesus. And, and whether we have a good memory associated with that word or a negative one, evangelism is... Uh, primarily uh, the, the means that God has designed for the truth about Jesus to be revealed to the world. And because of that, every Christian has a serious obligation to tell people about Jesus person to person. Um, now, already at the front, I know some of you are probably resistant to any ideas of evangelism for, for a number of reasons. But, but speaking as somebody who is part of our leadership team, I know for a 100% fact that if we're actually going to live out our mission statement, um, if we're going to live out the mission um, that we believe God has called us to individually, but specifically as a church, every single one of us who call Crossbridge home, um, every single one of us who are Christ followers need to engage non-Christians with the good news about Jesus in our daily lives. Now, at the outset, when it comes to sharing the good news about Jesus and the gospel with other people, I do want to say um, that I think there are two prevalent myths that exist within modern um, American Christianity specifically um, that I do think are unhealthy and unbiblical. Um, and so I want to kind of set those, I want to get those out and set those to the side so we can move into um, some of the other more important ideas of evangelism. Um, the first of those myths regarding uh, telling people about Jesus is that you have to have a relationship with someone before you can share the gospel with them. Uh, and I think this passage that we read in Acts chapter 8, the one that we started off with, is the perfect example of, of that not being the case. Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch is a story where we see God basically kind of opening that door when he, he Philip perceived like God speaking to him saying, Hey, go talk to this guy about Jesus. And, and the eunuch, the, the Ethiopian man didn't know Philip from anyone. Like he had never met this guy before. And he knew that, um, and Philip knew that God was putting this man in his path. And so he preached the good news of the gospel to this Ethiopian man. And immediately, immediately this man accepts Christ and is baptized. It, it doesn't say that months went by or weeks went by or even days or, or we can assume maybe some hours went by, but it was, there was not a whole lot of relational collateral that Philip had built with this man, which I think is really cool. Um, and I think is really amazing and, and I really think that the very same thing can and will happen to us when we start regularly just daily engaging people with the words of the gospel. And 
The reason I believe that um, is because I know God is going to give us doors, open doors to walk through. Um, There may be times where we are dealing with closed doors um, and people not being open and not being perceptive to the gospel. But I do know for a fact that God is going to put people in our lives who are open and perceptive to the gospel. And when we perceive that open door, we have to, in obedience, walk through that door, regardless of whether or not we feel qualified or regardless of whether or not we feel the person and us have a good enough relationship to have that conversation. Uh, Like Wes talked about last week, we don't need to do God's part. Uh, We don't need to do their part, but we do need to do our part. And sometimes that means engaging in a Jesus-centered conversation with somebody who we have zero relational collateral with. Um, The second myth that I think um, that exists kind of within American Christianity is that you can live outwardly like Jesus and that's enough to evangelize the people. And I don't think this is biblically accurate either. Um, You don't see Jesus do this. You don't see the disciples do this. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that Christ-like behavior is all you need to proclaim the gospel. I mean, if you go back and reread the book of Mark, Jesus talks a ton about the kingdom of God constantly. After his ascension into heaven, or after Jesus' ascension into heaven, Um, The disciples followed the lead of Jesus and preached the gospel using words constantly. Um, And and so we have to do the same. Um, if, if, If Jesus you know, sent his disciples out to preach the word and he himself preached the word. And then the disciples preached the word and then also taught other people how to preach the word. Then I think it stands to reason that we have, uh, we have an obligation to do the same. Um, I think a lot of the belief in this, in that kind of myth around evangelism comes from this famous quote that probably a lot of you have heard, which is preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Um, which is the basically, it's like the equivalent of saying that if I live a certain way, people will just notice that I'm different and ask me about it. And I do think there's some truth to that. But the important, the, the really significant difference in this is that simply living a moral life points people to good morals. It doesn't point them to the gospel and it doesn't point them to Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that no one is ever going to come up to you and ask you like, hey, why, you know, why don't you, you know, do X, Y, or Z, or why do you do these things that you do? Um, That, that could very well happen. But I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus, uh, and, you know, you read it multiple times within scripture, Jesus sends his disciples into the world. He doesn't tell them to wait for the world to come to us. He doesn't tell his disciples, hey, sit where you are. People are going to come to you and ask questions. No. What it, what happens is that Jesus and the disciples commission other people to go into the world to preach the gospel. The way we live does bring validation to our gospel message, or at least it should bring validation to our gospel message. But on its own, it's not enough. It needs to be accompanied by a verbal explanation of the saving work of Christ and all the other truths of the gospel. And I think, you know, like Wes talked about last week, this is why Jesus sends his disciples out in Matthew chapter 10. I mean, if it were ever enough for people to just live it out as proclamation of the gospel, it certainly would have been when Jesus, the living, breathing proof of the gospel was there with them. But it wasn't enough for Jesus. Um, So he sent his disciples out to proclaim the kingdom of God for others. And I think we have an understanding that we have to do the same. Uh, Several weeks ago, I read about a court case that was lost because of the silence of an attorney. There is a distinguished lawyer named Samuel Hoare, and he was representing his defendant sometime in like the early 1800s. And when it came time to present his case, he told the jury that the facts favoring his client were so evident that he wasn't going to insult their intelligence by having like any sort of like closing arguments. Well, the jury went and retired to deliberate and they returned in just a few short minutes with a verdict of guilty. And Samuel Hoare was astonished. He said, how could you guys have reached a verdict like that? And with such, you know, an evidence in in the favor of my client and the foreman of the jury said well we all agreed that if anything could be said for a case you would have said it but since you didn't present any evidence we decided to rule against you 
And in this circumstance, this silence of this lawyer had lost the case for his client. And after I read that story, um, you know, my brain was, you know, trying to connect the dots of like, you know, what does this look like for us in our lives as Christians? And it made me wonder how many times that I think I've probably missed an incredible opportunity to tell somebody my testimony or um, the story of the truth and the, the how awesome Jesus is because I remained silent because I thought, you know, there's so many things that are in favor for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of Jesus, that I don't really have to say anything. And that also made me wonder how many times I play a part in someone's inability to respond to the gospel because of the words that I don't say. And then it made me wonder, <laughs> I think the worst of it all is that sometimes I'm I'm really fearful that based on conversations that I have with people who haven't heard the gospel, they may conclude that salvation and Jesus and Christianity isn't even important enough to talk about because I don't talk about it with them. Um, and that's like a, to me, that's a really scary and concerning thought. Um, Paul writes in Romans chapter 10 verses 14 and 14 through 15. He says, how then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written in Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. These verses, um, we see this kind of like logical progression. Uh, uh, Paul kind of writes that, that shows us that Christians are sent to preach the gospel so that non-Christians can hear the gospel believe in the gospel and respond to the gospel by calling on the Lord. And I think it's important to look at that idea as a chain. And when you do, it becomes like really evident that if any part of that kind of chain along the way is broken, whether it be to neglect or silence or fear, people cannot and will not hear the saving truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I played a, a bunch of sports and whenever we would do conditioning or really hard workouts, there was this tendency for some of the guys who were more out of shape or neglectful of their other workouts they should have been doing. And a lot of times those guys would f fall behind. And there, there are a couple times where some guys would give up and there was like this motivational kind of phrase that a lot of the coaches would say to them. And, and, you know, a lot of you have probably heard it, but it would, they would yell out a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And, you know, they would yell a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Now, uh, again, you know, piggybacking off of what Wes talked about last week, we can't do anything in terms of making sure that people respond to the gospel by calling on the Lord. That's that's God's part and that's their part. But we can do our best to provoke the hearts and the minds of people to respond to the good news by talking to them about that. There's a, a really famous uh, magician, actor, whatever you want to call him. His name is Penn Jillette, and he's a he's a pretty staunch atheist who who told the story once of a guy who was waiting for him after a show and he, the guy walked up and you know just kind of like started evangelizing to him and handed him a bible and you know Penn Jillette recounts that this guy was like really genuine really nice um and the guy knew Penn Jillette was an atheist and he, he you know he kind of came up to him afterwards and and told him the story of Jesus and Penn even though he was an atheist he said um, in response to this, he said, I, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't evangelize. I don't respect it at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because you think it would make it socially awkward. He says, how much do you have to hate somebody to not evangelize to them? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that the truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this eternal life is more important to that. Now, the story of the gospel and the story of Jesus is, is more and greater than just eternal life. Um, that's a really simplistic view of it. We pursue a relationship with Jesus, not just because of 
heaven, not just because of eternal life. We pursue relationship with Jesus because we really do believe he is the son of God. He is the, he is our Lord. He is our savior. He really did come to this earth to be our king, to be our savior, um, to teach us how to live, to, to show us a more God honoring way to go about how we interact with ourselves, with each other, with our families, whatever. Um, but I think at this quote, Penn actually gets to the crux of all of this idea of evangelism and telling people about Jesus. Um, we don't evangelize the people. We don't tell people about the gospel message. We don't provoke people towards Christ out of compulsion or out of duty or because we feel shamed if we aren't being a quote unquote good Christian in that way. Um, we share the gospel out of love. We do it because we want them to experience the same love we have experienced in Christ. We do it because we want them to know the same savior that we know who has rescued us from our sin and brought so much freedom and love and so many amazing things into our life. Second Corinthians five fourteen through 15 says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And Jesus died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Jesus who died for them and was raised again. Did you catch that? Did you catch? This is a really important verse for all Christians. What compels us? It says Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that Jesus died for us and that we should no longer live for ourselves, but we live for Jesus who died for us and was raised again. Christ's love compels us. It's not compulsion. It's not shame. It's not fear. It's not guilt. It's Christ's love that compels us. The first century church and the disciples didn't add literally thousands of Christians to their communities in that first like hundred or so years of the church existing because of achievement, because of guilt, because of shame or a sense of duty. They added thousands to their numbers because of the love of Christ. They had experienced and seen the love of Christ so deeply that it truly drove them. It compelled them, Paul says. It was like something they couldn't help. It was a compulsion that they had. It drove them to preach the good news of Jesus, to preach the gospel. They couldn't help but tell people about this Jesus because who they knew God to be and what they had experienced uh, in Christ. Okay, so... We've perceived God has opened that door um, and and we see you know God leading us to have a conversation to a person. We're going to talk to them from a place of love, not compulsion um, or, or not not shame, not fear, not guilt, whatever. We're going to obediently step out into that space and tell someone about Jesus. But what do we say? you know what do we what do we talk about to that person? Um, and I think this is the biggest hang up, at least with me, I, I work predominantly with college students uh, in the ministry that I do. I think this is the biggest hang up that Christians have in talking to people who don't know Jesus is, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard college students say, I don't know enough or I don't know what to say to tell my friends about Jesus. And, and you, I think a lot of people would say they feel similar thoughts. Um, I know there's times where I go into conversations not confident because I know the person that I'm going to be talking to may be asking about or, or, or have objections to things that I just don't really have a good answer to. And I will say that might be true. You know, um, maybe you don't know what to say. Maybe you don't think you, maybe you don't actually know enough on your own to have that conversation. And I think, again, we have to look back to that passage in Acts chapter eight. We have to trust um, that the Holy Spirit is, is working in us and through us in those situations. Like if God leads us to a person to have a conversation with, he's not just going to abandon us once we start talking to that person about God. Um, we have to be confident in that. Um, trust that the Holy Spirit is working in you and through you in those situations. God will do the work um, in us and through us 
and help us if we can be bold enough to just step out in faith and start the conversation. Romans 8, 26 through 27 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now, the context of this passage isn't talking about evangelism, but I do firmly believe it to be applicable here. Um, There are times where in our weakness, the Holy Spirit helps us. We don't know what we ought to say. We don't know what we ought to do. We don't know how, you know, what things we ought to talk about. And we have to be confident that in the same way, when we don't know what to pray, when we come before God in our, in our moments of brokenness and sadness, that we have to be confident that the Holy Spirit will help us in those moments where we don't know what to say to somebody who doesn't know Jesus. I really think that God will give you everything you need if you obediently step into that position, um, once you perceive that somebody is open to the gospel and you want to provoke their heart and mind towards Jesus, I think if you are obediently stepping in that, God will give you everything you need to have that conversation. I mean, think about think about the disciples in the New Testament. Think about Jesus sending out the 12 in the, in the book of Acts. They didn't even have a physical Bible. Like, have you ever thought of that? Like, they didn't have the new testament in fact most people who you see recorded coming to christ whether it be in the gospels or acts or whoever or wherever those people came to to have a saving faith in jesus christ years before the words of the written new testament were put into a like bible into a combined kind of work and when you think about the disciples they were constantly getting parables wrong how many times think about how many times in the gospels like jesus tells a parable and the disciples are like i think you mean i think jesus means this and it's like completely wrong um the the disciples are constantly getting parables wrong they were misunderstanding the teachings of jesus they were doing goofy things like chopping a dude's ear off who came to arrest jesus denying jesus um directly towards a little girl like they were doing things that would make you think they were very unqualified to preach the gospel but Jesus, his examples would show us that they weren't. The Bible says that Jesus gave them the authority to preach and teach in his name. And because of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we've been given that very same authority um, through that spirit in our lives. Um, and so if those you know disciples who constantly got things wrong, constantly were messing up, um, doing things wrong, we're able to preach the gospel. Um, I think we can be confident that the Holy Spirit will help us in the same way it helped the disciples and the early church. So for me, here's basically what it comes down to when you talk to people about Jesus, when you when you're going to evangelize to them. I think you have two things that you kind of talk about. You tell them first what you believe, and second what you've experienced. Um, you tell them what you believe and what you've experienced in Christ. And so you walk up to them and say, hey, can I share with you what I've seen God and God do in my life and what I believe to be true about Jesus? And then you just start talking. Um, and at the end of it, I would in, I would encourage you to invite them to Crossbridge on a Sunday morning to your community group or start a Bible study with them or whatever. Um But I think those are the two areas where we can make some really big inroads with people who we who we um, sense God telling us to engage in conversations with them. Tell them um, what we know, even if we feel like we don't know a whole lot. Um, we tell them what we know and we tell them what we've experienced, which for some of you, that's going to be a hundred times more impactful than what you know. So maybe what you know is you feel is like a, a very small portion. You're like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know a whole lot of theology or doctrine. I don't really know a whole lot about the Bible. Well, tell them what you've experienced Christ do in your life. That in and of itself is a powerful testimony of the gospel um, that can be um, can be really, really impactful for people who don't know Jesus. So tell them what you know and tell them what you've experienced. Now, if you're like me and you're probably thinking, okay, that's good. Tell them what I know. Tell them what I've experienced. Um, but what do I actually say, right? Like for me, somebody gives me something to do and I want to know like the very specific details. Um, 
Well, I, I've put together just a brief video that's basically a, a very short outline of how you can explain to somebody who Jesus is and some of the central truths of the gospel. Um, it's not an end-all, be-all understanding of the gospel or the truth about God or the Bible. In fact, you may find it cheesy. You may find it useless. You may find it not your style, um, and that's okay. Uh, but I don't want you to allow this this short little video, this thing that I've put together to stop you. Um, I, I want you to figure out what works for you, figure out the things that you need to communicate the gospel, the truth about who Jesus is and what he's done for the world. I want you to figure out the way that you can communicate that effectively and be confident that God is with you. So check out this video and then I'll come back with some with some closing thoughts. So we live in this world and it's characterized by brokenness. We don't have to look very hard to see there are things like disease, disasters, wars. There's a lot of pain in this world, but this is not God's original design. God has a perfect design and the way that we have gotten ourselves into brokenness is through something that the Bible calls sin. Sin is turning away from God's design and pursuing our own way. And that leads us to brokenness and brokenness eventually leads us to death and this death will separate us from god forever but god doesn't want us to stay in brokenness so he's made a way out and that way is jesus jesus comes and he enters into our brokenness and the death that we deserve for pursuing brokenness jesus takes our place and he dies on a cross and his body is broken for us and three days after he dies he rose from the dead and he made a way out of the brokenness and people try many things to get out of the brokenness, like religion, success, relationships, education, or drugs and alcohol, but, but none of those things actually get us out of the brokenness. The only way out of the brokenness is through a relationship with Jesus. And if we turn to him and believe that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead, we can leave our brokenness and grow in a relationship with God and pursue his original perfect design. And more than that, we can go we can be just like Jesus and go back into the brokenness to help others come through the brokenness to pursue God's design for themselves. Now, there are two types of people in this world, people who are pursuing God's design and people who are pursuing brokenness. And so we have to ask ourselves, which one are we? Are we pursuing brokenness or are we pursuing God's perfect design for our lives? I'll make that uh, that video and that picture available to anyone who wants it. Just reach out to me. I can get it in your hands if you found it helpful. Um, just email the church, and I'll make sure that they uh, they can they can get it. Um, so uh, you know you've you've taken this tool that I've given you, or if you've come up with your own tool of how to like tell people about Jesus, how to provoke the minds and the hearts of people towards Jesus. Um, and you've started sharing the gospel with others regularly in your lives, um, in your in your daily life. Here, here are some things that I do want to leave you with that I think you should know moving forward. Um, the the first thing that that it's important to remember and to know is that sometimes the gospel is going to be offensive and divisive to some people. Um, that doesn't mean you're you're doing anything wrong. Sometimes you're going to tell people the truth about who you believe God to be and what you've seen Jesus do in your life, and that's one maybe not going to be good enough for them. It's not going to be satisfactory to them, or two, it may be outright um, offensive or divisive. The reality is, is that we even see that in Jesus's preachings. There are a number of times where Jesus says something to a group of people uh, about the truth, about who God is and what God has called them to be. And they, it, the Bible recounts multiple times of it saying the crowds left him. Like they were so disappointed with, with who Jesus said he was and what he came to do that they literally left him and walked away because they were unsatisfied with what he said. There were also other times where what he said was so bothersome that people left in anger because they found it offensive. And, and so just know that that may be the case and it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. If you tell somebody the truth about Jesus, about the gospel, and they reject it or they get mad or angry, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're doing anything wrong. The second thing to know is that you're going to fail to convince everyone. Again, 
even Jesus, who is far more equipped at preaching the gospel, he was the living truth of the gospel. He even was unable to convince everyone that he was actually the son of God, the, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. I mean, that's why they put him to death is because he said these things, but couldn't convince them that it was true. Um, but I think it's important in the midst of, of your perceived failure to trust and know that God is working. Be confident that God is with you in the obedience of the act, not in you just succeeding. Um, God is with you in the obedience of the act, not in just the success of the act. So if you fail, God is still with you in that because you are obediently walking walking uh, with him and, and obediently following him. Next thing is, is there, I think there's, it's important to remember, there's going to be times where you're not going to effectively and, and, um, you're not going to do a good job of, of valuing preaching the gospel of evangelizing over comfort and not being awkward. Um, there's going to be times where you give in to fear. And, um, I want you to know God does not want you to live in a, a place of shame because of that. Um, he doesn't want you to f- feel fearful or, you know, I can tell you, um, as many times as I can confidently speak for the leadership team and the times that we have failed to step obediently into this, like Crossbridge will never judge you or condemn you for you not being bold enough in sharing the gospel. We will want to encourage you in sharing the gospel, but if you value comfort and not being awkward over proclaiming the good news, um, don't feel guilty and shamed of that. Um, you should have a desire, again, out of love to do more and to be more effective next time. And so in those times, repent of your failings. Say, God, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to value my comfort or not being awkward over loving people well. Um, repent of that. Ask God to help shape and change your heart. Celebrate your need for grace. <laughs> you, you need as much grace in your life as the people that you are sharing the gospel with, right? Always remember that. And then pray for boldness and ask God to help you um, value um, uh, human other other people over our over our comfort over our over our non being awkward. Um, the last thing is, is I think you should have somebody to lean on in this. Um, even Jesus, when he sends his disciples out, sends them out in groups of two. Um, have someone to share your victories and failures with as you kind of step into this space of being obedient and sharing the gospel and telling people about Jesus and inviting them to Crossbridge or your community group or to be a part of your Bible study. Have somebody that you can share your victories and failures with. Don't fly solo in this. Um, as we all seek to, to walk in obedience in, there, in this area, my hope is that we will love people in the same way that Christ loved us when he died for us. Um, my hope is that we will do whatever it takes to, to share this message of, of truth and hope and freedom from sin, um, this, this gospel of Jesus with everyone, and, and that we'll do so from a position of love because we love them and we want them to know the same Savior that we know. As we finish up this series, our worship team actually came across this really cool prayer that we thought captured the ideas we've been talking about over the past three or four weeks together well and seemed like a good prayer for us to pray together as we move into the future. O Holy Spirit, beloved of my soul, I adore you. Enlighten me. Guide me. Strengthen me. Console me. Tell me what I should do. Give me your orders. I promise to submit myself to all that you desire of me and to accept all that you permit to happen to me. Let me only know your will. Amen. And so just like our friends on screen did for us right now, I'd love for us, we're going to throw the words of this prayer up on the screen for you right now. And wherever you are, wherever you're doing, I just love for you, if you would, to open your hands up to heaven as a sign of receiving from God. We're going to ask him for his empowerment and his help as we go in the midst of a crazy season in the world around us to make a difference. Let's pray these words again together. O Holy Spirit, beloved of my soul, I adore you. Enlighten me, guide me, strengthen me, console me. Tell me what I should do. Give me your orders. 
I promise to submit myself to all that you desire of me and to accept all that you permit to happen to me. Let me only know your will. Amen. May that be our prayer as we move through this season together. Uh, next week, we're going to start a new series of messages. Our friend Marco Waters is going to come and be speaking to us. Uh, we're calling it No Ordinary Father, and we're going to talk about some of the really cool things that distinguish God and make him just man, the most incredible, amazing Heavenly Father. You won't want to miss it. It's a great time to invite a friend to come and join you, maybe even to do that this week as the Holy Spirit prompts you. Thanks for joining us, and go in grace and peace this week. We'll catch you back here again next Sunday morning.